Hey, welcome back. Uh, in the previous video, uh, we went over a simple representation of a confusion matrix. And I'm going to show you a nicer and more optimized way of generating uh, a confusion matrix. Um, as you can see uh, in the previous video, we actually calculated confusion matrix by using the table function. Uh, it's literally a contingency table um, between predicted variables versus actual variables. Um, okay, uh, and also these values are on the training data only, right? So this is my training information. Um, as you realize this, uh, this is the raw uh, shape of a confusion matrix. And if you would like to generate a, a more optimized way of generating confusion matrix, you have to install these two libraries. Um, please pause this video and make sure that you run first uh, line 69 and line 70. And after you did that, make sure that these packages are correctly installed and import them by calling line 71 and line 72 by executing these two lines so that we can start working on confusion metrics function. Okay, um, pause this video, first install these packages and then import them back. Okay, so let's continue. Um, I already installed these packages. That means the queued line 71 and 72. Um, control, command, and return. So uh, those are carried and E1071 package are, packages are already loaded. And now I can call my confusion metrics um, and then I can plug in the contingency table that I just created. Um, you could actually create confusion metrics by directly uh, putting your predicted uh, values into it on the first spot and, uh, and also your actual values on the second spot. Remember, this is on the training data. We are using the training data's um, ultimate values observations. And we also made our predictions with pred ones uh, by using our logistics regression model up in there, right? So we did use predict ones here, right? If our probabilities are greater than 0 0.5, we actually assign one. And if not, we assign zero here. This basically um, tells us that um, we could um, we could represent it in two different ways. If you already generated the, the contingency table like this, you can directly plug it in, or you could actually call it like this. All right, let's run or execute line 73. And let's see what information I get out of it. It actually gives me the same confusion metrics that I just created. And it also gives me other statistics, like for example, accuracy, 95% confidence interval on accuracy. It basically tells me that uh, my accuracy is around 85%, which is really good, right? So with 100, uh, 85% accuracy, I could predict the lasagna fryers in my data set. And these are my confidence intervals, okay? And I do have also my sensitivity and specificity information. Um, the article that I mentioned, they do a great job discussing what sensitivity and specificity is. Make sure that you take a good look into it. Okay, so this is also an automatic way of generating confusion metrics. As I said, this is on my training data. So let's test these results on my test data. So how do we do it? We simply use the same model that I trained, model two, my model two, and I call it in my predict function to predict my um, results for the test data, as you can see on the second spot, and the type as a response. And this is again going to create the probabilities for the people in my test data set and store them in vector two, P2. Let's execute this line, 77. And if you look at P2, let's display P2. And these are simply the probabilities that I would like to see in my test data. Um, you could actually call uh, what literally you see in the test data. Um, the first probability, let's see, let's see the first probability of my uh, test data. It is actually a really high number in my test data. Remember, this data set 
is not used in training my logistics regression. My logistics regression never saw this data set. Um, the fact that I already know what they did, uh, it does not really imply the fact that my model, um, uh, my model actually saw what they did. My model actually did not see those, right? My model only saw uh, the people, the results of um, the people in my training data set. That's why we can use uh, this method to validate our results that we just generated um, for the logistic regression by going over the training data set. Um, the probability that it gave me is greater than 0 0.5 and the actual result was actually um, positive as well. So it's going to be a correct classification. Well, let's see um, if we can convert these probabilities into uh, ones and zeros by using the false function. Recall that if the probability is greater than 0 0.5, this is going to assign one. If not, it's going to assign zero to print two values, okay? Let's display them, and these are actually my predictions. Uh, we would like to put our predictions in confusion matrix format so that we could just see the results, right? I'm going to be using the same format. First, I'm going to put them in um, contingency table format. This time, I'm going to be using my test data and my predictions for the test data, and I call it table two, TAB2. Let's display TAB2. This is manual way of generating your confusion matrix. And let's actually call the confusion matrix function uh, to tell us what we did. Well, as you can see, our accuracy went down. It was 75%. Now it is uh, on the test data, it is 79% or 80%. Um, our validation data showed us that actually it's better than a pure chance, right? The pure chance is 50%, uh, 50%. If a person comes in and you know nothing about that person, there's a 50% chance that that person tries your lasagna or does not try your lasagna. Well, with this model, we actually take it to 80% on the test data and 84%, 85% on the training data. Um, and the sensitivity and specificity information can be found here. Um, this is a nice way of uh, comparing different logistics regression or classification models. You look at the confusion metrics and you look at the accuracy and specific and sensitivity to basically see um, how precise your model is and how sensitive your model to making errors, right? So those are captured under specific and sensitivity information. Um, there is also another way of uh, comparing different models visually, and that is called receiver operating characteristics curve, ROC curve. Uh, the article does a great job explaining the ROC curve over here. Um, you could take a look at that section as well. Um, but what I'm going to show you first, um, you need to install this package called PROC. Uh, make sure that you spell it correctly. Uh, R is case sensitive. Um, P is small, ROC is capital. Okay, pause this video, install this, and come back. After you install it, make sure that you execute this line to activate the PROC um, library. Um, and I'm going to be using this comment to make sure that, well, actually, I'm not going to execute it, and I will execute it later to see um, the impact. You will see that the impact that this uh, very small comment makes on the plot section. And then um, after you imported this uh, library um, and you called it, uh, all you have to do is to use the ROC function. And in the ROC function you do, I'm working on the ROC function on the, of the logistics regression uh, on the train data, and then I'm going to do it on the test data as well. Okay, so remember that I do keep my training data and hit right. This is my actual observation P1 is my predictions, right? Um, and I just, these are the parameters of the ROC curve. Make sure that you specify them correctly. Um, and XLab and YLab, those are the, the tiles of the, the graph that I'm about to generate. And if you hit um, comment and return on this line, you get the ROC curve like this. Um, 
Okay, so, um, and now let's execute this line 91 and then rerun the line 93. Do you see how nice it is, you know, taking up the shape itself, right? It is actually giving you the false positive percentage on the x-axis and true positive percentage on the y-axis. And you don't want to go and select this line or this, this, this point. Let me activate my annotate tool. All right, here. Um, you don't want to go ahead and select this line right over here, uh, this point right over here, because your false positive rate is almost like you know, 100%. And you don't want to come over here and select this line or this point of your model because your true positive percentage rate is going to be almost zero, right? Although your false positive percentage is zero, um, your true positive percentage is also zero. You would like to select somewhere here on this tipping point. Imagine that this is an elbow uh, and then the tipping point of your elbow would be the model that you should you should select. At that point, you have more than 80% true positive percentage um, rate and you have a little false positive percentage rate, okay? ROC curves uh, are out there to, you know, help you decide, for example, what your cutoff point would be. Remember, I use 50% as my cutoff point. You could use several, like you could try 60%, 70%, 30%, or maybe even 40% as your cutoff point and come over here and then try to look at the ROC curves um, and then decide which ROC curve is going to give you the better results. Or alternatively, you could look at the confusion matrices to see um, your accuracy level, your um, sensitivity and specificity, and, and then decide whether um, you want to go with a certain cutoff point or, um, um, or a different cutoff point. Okay, so this is my ROC curve for my training data. And this would be the ROC curve for my testing data, okay? Um, so yeah, if you would like to convert this um, um, frame into its original, then you run 101 and then you can run the same comments. What you see here is that you see some black spaces here, sorry, white spaces here. Those are, um, not used, not utilized. And what this um, comment does is to actually shorten those white spaces um, so that you could actually, your, your pictures, your graphs could utilize more of those uh, white spaces. Uh, and it looks nicer in this way. Um, thank you so much for watching. And this would be the end of logistics regression.